Dear all, welcome to Anamed Library Talk. At today's talk, we have distinguished speakers with us, Serra Akboy İlk and Sunat Çağaptay. Today's talk is entitled Architectural Documentation, Built Environment, Modernization and Turkish Nationalism. This talk is based on uh, the book Architectural Documentation, B Built Environment, Modernization and Turkish Nationalism. In early Republican Turkey, architects and scholars had all been in a position to advise on archival building documentation as a scientific basis to protect the built environment and to ensure its continuity for future generations. The questions remained, however, how did the mission of creating measured drowning, drownings of historic property, properties met their goal of protecting the monuments? Was the goal to encourage broader historical understanding of architecture, the nation less need for detailed drownings, or to assist building reconstruction, entitling drownings with more information. Reflection on the collection of field notes and formalized measured drownings as a whole, the talk addresses the enterprise of architectural documentation in the early republic. At this point, I would like to introduce you our speakers. Sarah Akpo Ilk currently works in Colin College teaching design and historic preservation courses. Sarah Akpo Ilk holds Bachelor of Architecture from uh, Mimar Sinan Fine Arts University and MA in Anatolian Civilizations and Cultural Heritage Management from Koç University, Istanbul, along with PhD in Architecture from Texas A&M University. Her research interests include drawing, architectural documentation, and historiography of Turkish art and architecture. To date, Serra Akboy Ilk has published in numerous journals, including Architectural Histories, Journal of Architecture Planning and Research, Journal of Drawing Research, Theory and Practice, Preservation Education and Research, Turkish Historical Review, and Yıllık, and Yule of Istanbul Studies. Her book, Architectural Documentation, Built Environment, Modernization and Turkish Nationalism was published by Vernon Press in 2022. Sunat Aptay is an associate, pro associate professor of archaeology and architectural history at Mula Sıtkı Koçman University. She works on late medieval and early modern architecture and city-making practices in the Eastern Mediterranean and the after afterlives of the ancient cities. She received numerous fellowships, fieldwork, and research positions, including the Dumberton Oaks, Agahan Islamic and Architecture at MIT, Anamet as junior and senior, Barakat Foundation, and the University of Cambridge since 2022. Sorry, since 2022, she has been directing the excavation at Anaya, Turkish Kadıkalesi, in Kuşadası. Her publications include the first Ottoman capital, the religious, architectural, and social history of Bursa, and articles that have appeared in Dumberton Oaks paper, Art Bulletin, Mukarnas, Byzantine and Modern Greek Studies, Spe Speculum, Ege Mimarlık, Orta Çağ Araştırmaları Dergisi, and the Turkish Studies Review. She also co-edited a volume titled Stiz S. Palimsets. Dear attendees, please be reminded that your video and audios are closed. Uh, please type your questions in the chat section. Your questions will be answered in uh, the Q&A session. Now I am passing the word to Suno Çağaptay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Irem Hanım. Um, that's, that was a great and generous introduction. As uh, Irem said, I'm going to be the moderator for uh, today's uh, book talk. And I am very delighted to be moderating this uh, uh, meeting, I should say. Um, our speaker is Sarah Akboyik, and she's going to be telling us about her recently published book titled Architectural Documentation, Built Environment, Modernization, and Turkish Nationalism. Um, I think we are going to start with uh, Sarah talking about her book, uh, outlining um, its uh, main framework, uh, arguments, and uh, uh, uh, the the findings uh, in her work. So we are going to start with her, and then uh, once she finish finishes her talk and presentation, we'll carry on with questions. Uh, Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, 
um, can I start the sharing, I guess? Okay. And thank you so much for your kind words. Uh, okay. Am I sharing? Is it there? Welcome to the Digital Dark Ages. Okay. Thank you so much for your kind words, uh, dear Iram Unal and Snachap Tai. Thank you so much for inviting me and providing me the opportunity to talk about my work and my book. So before we start, I would like to express my gratitude to Anamit uh, for organizing the library talks, which gives us the opportunity to exchange our ideas. And um, although virtual meeting with scholars, um, educators and students. And also I would like to thank South Research, uh, Snukrach Library at Koch University, and um, Wehbi Koch Ankara Study Center, and also Kubel Tavakov Collection for kindly letting me use the uh, primary sources in my book and also in my other uh, publications as well. And above all, before we start, I would like to thank all the heroes and heroines and the thinkers and the pioneers of the Turkish preservation movement. Today, we're going to meet some of them, uh, but hopefully, of course, there are so many uh, preservationists that we still need to meet. And hopefully with the expansion of the new public and private archives, uh, we will have the opportunity to get to know them as well. Thank you so much. So without further ado, I would like to start with the basic question. So what is architectural documentation? So architectural documentation has two tiers. Uh, it is collecting the sort metric data from the uh, building surfaces uh, with analog and digital methods. So uh, tape measures, bubble levels, laser scanners, photogrammetric tools. So either uh, we collect those surface measurements one by one or in a, a point cloud form. And then delivering this information in two-dimensional and three-dimensional three-dimensional graphic representations. So, um, and the weight of architectural documentation is actually depicting the as-is condition of the building surfaces. So this is very important. Uh, this is the core of my study, my book. Um, let me explain my thinking. So for instance, now I know we're not in the animate building, right? We're virtual meeting, uh, but let's say that we're tasked with documenting the animate building in Beolo, which is a 19th century building. So what we do actually, we uh, take our tape measure or laser scanner or a, a tape measure, whatever we have, and we collect uh, surface measurements from the animate building as in 2024, as of today. And we compile them in measured drawings uh, to show the physical appearance of the animate building today, okay? So it's all about depicting the as-is condition of the building surfaces. But if we are tasked with the documentation of the animate building a decade later in 2034, again, today's uh, measured drawing set will be the basis but again, we're gonna get our tape measure or laser scanner, and we're going to make measured drawings of the animate building as it looks in 2034. So this is really important. The gist of the architectural documentation activity is to depict the building of the, uh, uh, uh, at the time of recording. And so why early Republican architects documented historic properties? Um, there are so many, there are, different reasons. Uh, first of all, they wanted to conduct research on the built environment. So um, state agencies, either they commission scholars to compile monographs or architects or theorists, they documented the uh, buildings for, the, for their own research. Uh, the other uh, I came across over and over, um, the preservationists, they wanted to record architectural at, at, at risk. So to make a record of the historic property before it is mutilated, altered, or vanished. And actually here today, I brought a measured drawing probably from the St. Gregory, the Illuminator Church of Galata. So I came across to this drawing at Salt, and but I couldn't actually uh, correlate this drawing to uh, uh, uh, the um, 
to a to the to a certain a building. So this is what I why suspect. This is the Saint Gregory the Illuminated Church of Galata, probably drawn in around 1958 uh, during the Menderes, you know, planning master plans of Istanbul. So any any member of the audience, if you can correlate the drawing to the building, let me know, and I will more than happen to share share the uh, drawing with you. So let's come back to our presentation. So then uh, there is another reason for the preservationists to make measured drawings. Uh, it's important for the preservationists to make measured drawings to inform the repairs, maintenance, and physical interventions during a historic preservation project. So this is Ekrem Hakka Ayar, there's measured drawing of the tiled kiosk uh, during the during his work, preservation work at the Topkapi Palace Museum in the 1940s, 1944, 1940s. So, and also what I saw in my research that uh, some of the architects, engineers like uh, Ivar, the um, preservation uh, engineer and uh, Alisaim Utgan, they uh, measured their surroundings because they intended to use these measured, uh, measured drawings in their later work. Or um, some architects and engineers, they were already working on certain projects and they already have their measured drawings. So, and they, uh, or, or they have those measured drawings for the on ongoing work and they publish those drawings um, in the scale of monographs. So why, I wrote a book on the early Republic and culture of architectural documentation then, right? So if uh, these reasons are clear and the preservationists, they documented their surroundings, they published monographs, why there's this gray area? Why I wrote a book on uh, the culture of architectural documentation? So first of all, let me start again. This is my second uh, important but uh, this is the second important message of the book, uh, how the early Republican architects and theorists define architectural documentation and measured drawings, because that is related to their, this is related to their thinking. So uh, they all defined architectural documentation as the scientific basis to protect the built environment and to ensure its continuity to the future generations. So this is really important. So they saw architectural documentation as a scientific method to protect the built environment. And in this sense, they read measured drawings as the scientific record of the historic property on paper. So, uh, and this is, and we will uh, circle back uh, to this definition later in the presentation. However, if um, they have, this mentality, how did the mission of creating measured, measured drawings of historic properties met their goal of protecting the monuments? And this is Alisaim Ulgan's uh, measured drawing of the Yeni, uh, Yeni Mosque, and this is a section drawing. Um, again, this, uh, this, is, this drawing is part of the published monograph Yeni Jami. And here today, actually, um, I brought another measured drawing uh, so this measure drawing um, is uh, of the Hindelar Lodge. And um, this draw drawing is from the late Genghis Bektash's architectural firm. Genghis Bektash uh, was a celebrated Turkish architect, poet, and author. And hopefully in one day we'll have another lecture to talk about his work as well. So this, draw this measure drawing is of the Hindelar Lodge. And this is a working drawing. So when I say a working drawing, meaning that the architects at the architectural firm use this measured drawing um, to guide the construction work. So, and to, they use this measured drawing as the basis of the restoration work. So that's why in this measured drawing, we see all these dimensions, all the information on materials and all these annotations. So this measured drawing is a um, working drawing and it guides, it, it's, it's made to guide the construction work as part of the preservation work. And it, uh, let me go back to the slide. So it's more clear, right? This is 
a measure drawing uh, from a published monograph of Yenijami, and this is a measure drawing made for um, um, the line of preservation work. So then uh, what was the goal of the early Republican preservationists with documentation? Was their goal to encourage broader historical understanding of architecture, denoting less need for detailed drawings, just like the section drawing of Yenijami, the slide before, or assist, assist building reconstruction, we meaning that entailing major drawings with more information, just like this drawing I brought uh, today uh, from uh, Genghis Bektash, the firm of architecture Genghis Bektash. And, uh, and, uh, and the early Republic, the architects, they knew the difference. Here today, I brought this memo uh, of Alessaim Ugan, and, and this is very interesting because um, this exemplifies that uh, early Republican architects and uh, the, the engineers, the preservationists, they knew the difference between a measured drawing for a broader historical understanding and the measured drawing for construction work. So when in 1956, the Minister of Education, when they asked Ulgan to make uh, measured drawings of Aksaray Sultanhan in just two months, not only the measured drawing set, but also the restoration drawings, um, Ulgan keenly responded and he keenly explained that the measured drawings for historical understanding and the measured drawings for restoration work, they are two different type of depictions. The ones for historical understanding, uh, they have 100th architectural scale that they're gonna have less details, they're gonna have less dimensions. But on the other hand, the drawings for uh, restoration work, they are going to be in one, uh, 150th architectural scale, meaning that the measured drawings as working drawings uh, the, the drawing sheets, first of all, they're going to double up the size and they're going to have more information on the materials and the details and the annotations, and it's going to take more time. And also, um, Ulgan kindly uh, uh, warned the Minister of Education that if the goal is restoration, so the measured drawings for restoration, they are not enough for the restoration package, the brief, the drawing set, but also they have to, he has to include um, the drawings for the foundation, the drawings for the roof, consolidation plans, repair estimates, and all in different scales. And, and at Ulgan, in the, in the bottom part, he, he added that he is, and he is willing to uh, shoulder all these drawing tasks, uh, including the major drawing sets and the restoration drawings, if only with the condition that Ulgan himself would set the work schedule for the drawings. So this memo explains us that they knew the difference between um, different measured drawings, right? And here, before I go to the second slide, again, I would like to share another memo of Ulgan um, because in 2000, we're in 2000, 2024, you know, a nice September day here, that's a September morning. But if you're in Turkey, that's a September afternoon, a part of me evening. Um, but and we uh, sometimes we think that uh, uh, sometimes we cannot relate our understanding of documentation or our understanding of, of historical preservation uh, with what these thinkers wrote in 1930s. But actually they wrote, everything is there. Everything is in the archives. We only search and look for the uh, materials. So for instance, Ulgan, this is one of the memos he circulated when he was working at the Ministry of Education. And here actually he explains uh, the principles for restoration. And we'll see that uh, documentation and restoration, they are two different activities. So, and when he, explains the principles for restoration, Ulgan actually uh, recommends stylistic unity. Um, but the way he recommends, he, he actually highlights the, the, the goal for um, restoration, 
is safeguarding the original form, asli şekil, which means also authentic form. So original and authentic, we can use these two words interchangeably. So the gist of the restoration activity is to safeguard the original form for future generations. And what they meant with the original form, again, this is related to the um, 19th century thinking of nationalism and positivism. So preserving the authentic, the original configuration of the building, if it was built in the 15th century, so let's keep that to the future. If it's that built in the 18th century, uh, not 16th century, let's uh, forward that future in an intact version, okay? And that means that removing the additions that had distorted the authentic form. So I gave this explanation because now we're going to talk about the monographs that these architects uh, published. So actually my book is about the published monographs of architectural stories. So now we have all these monographs published around uh, in the early Republic and, when, um, and these monographs, they are meant for measure drawings. So they are meant to depict the as is conditions of the um, architectural heritage at the time of recording, right? So, but also in all these monographs, we see drawing sheets, which introduce the graphically restored versions of buildings. Um, they are not, rest uh, they are restoration drawings, uh, but th these drawings, they guide the restoration work. So why the, uh, the, the, the architects, they published um, in monographs meant for measured drawings, but they also included um, graphically uh, restored versions of the properties. Here, this is uh, Ulyan's monograph on Sinan. Again, uh, this is a monograph meant for the measured drawing sets of Sinan's legacy, architect Sinan's legacy. But again, in, the, in this compilation, we see uh, a drawings, graphically restored versions of the buildings as well. And, um, and sometimes we don't even know, um, and sometimes uh, Ulyan didn't write about the physical evidence why he, the, why he made these decisions. We saw uh, these um, nuances in Ayverdi's publications too. For instance, uh, this is Ekrem Akka Ayverdi's Fatih Devri Mimarisi, again, a monograph meant for um, um, publication meant for measured surveys, but again, um, um, Ayverdi is introducing um, graphically restored versions of buildings. And this is from the Topkapı Palace Museum. Uh, like I said a couple of slides before, uh, uh, Ulgan, uh, not pardon me, not Ulgan, Ayverdi orchestrated the repairs and the restoration work at the, of the building buildings at the uh, Topkapı Palace Museum. So this is the Agaz Mosque, um, Alar Jami, uh, which was the palace, um, which was built after the conquest of Constantinople and served as the central mosque of the palace. So, and in the, and, and in the history preservation classes that I'm teaching today in 2024, I always teach in my students, um, we have to uh, conceptualize buildings like humans. Uh, buildings have life cycles and they have different phases. It, it doesn't mean that they die, but it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that buildings they die, but it means that they have certain phases in, in their life cycles that we have to honor. And in this drawing, actually, so when we look at the top, uh, this is the drawing showing the existing um, existing um, configuration of the building. Uh, we see that uh, the, wa the walls are elevated, the authentic windows were changed and the original roof was substituted with a barrel vault. And the masjid, a neighborhood mosque, a small mosque, uh, was added as an annex to the building. But here, uh, this is the graphically restored version of the same mosque, where actually uh, Ivar de demolished the annex virtually, and then he replaced the barrel vault uh, with the dome. And here, Ivar de writes that the mosque with this configuration, with these changes, um, the mosque would return to its authentic 15th century setting and retain its integrity. Again, stylistic purity. Again, our, uh, their goal was to bring that authentic uh, configuration of the buildings. 
also we see that the same we see that the same perspectives the same uh, attitude uh, with Serat Chetintas um, here uh, he has published monographs um, um, especially on the monuments of Bursa again we have the same mentality in the monograph uh, he has many drawing sheets but today I brought the one from Yildirim Darish Fasse again uh, we have one drawing showing the um, site plan, the property, the historic property before excavation. Uh, we have one measure drawing set showing what they uh, uh, what they achieved, what they found out after the excavation, and the third actually uh, shows the um, a meticulous rendering of the so-called pristine, pure authentic version of the of, of the building see in we, we can see the differentiation uh, before the excavation and documentation uh, the measured drawing the floor plan uh, after what they found um, the, the, the document uh, recording work and this is what uh Chetintash thought of the pristine authentic pure version of the um, of the building so and all these uh, work, the published architectural surveys, convincingly show that uh, the measured drawings became to be seen as self-referential scientific documents, right? We're circling back to the scientific documents, replicating the buildings uh, on paper for archival building documentation. Not archival documentation, but archival, uh, not uh, architectural documentation, but archival building documentation. So the difference that I'm using this term now, because these drawings serve the purpose of education and research. And with um, and these drawings, in terms of scale of the measured drawing sets, in terms of the contents of the folios, uh, they were not really allied with the line of the preservation work, right? If we refresh our memories 10 slides before, I brought a working drawing, a major drawing set from the Hindalar Lodge, uh, from the architectural office of Je late Genghis Bektash, uh, with more dimensions, with door uh, connotations, with more information, uh, which makes the infrastructure for the construction work. So by contrast, with using the archi archival building documentation, I'm referring these published monographs, uh, usually set up as pattern books of architectural plans and selected individual building motifs. And I use this term uh, actually in my book as well. So when we come uh, back to my book, uh, again, we're already talking about the contents of my book, but here actually uh, we're talking uh, I gave the structural layout. I I I, uh, how I structured my book and the uh, coming up chapters. So in Turkey, when we look at the uh, look at the modern preservation movement, uh, we actually set a certain date. This is a symbolic meaning for us. In all the historic preservation books, uh, we use the date 1930, 1931 as the symbolic. Uh, start date um, for the uh, preservation movement. Let me have a sip of my coffee. And this is the date of uh, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, his telegraph to Ismet Inonu, and which sets the official start of the historic preservation movement in Turkey. So after months of um, traveling in Turkey, and uh, Atatürk saw the dilapidated condition of the built environment, and he sent a telegraph to Inanu, um, signifying the importance of preserving uh, the built environment. And Atatürk actually, he in this telegraph, signified the importance of methodical documentation and classification of historic properties as the scientific basis of maintenance and repairs. And this is, I really like this photograph. Uh, I found this in the, um, uh, Coach University Ankara Studies Research Center. And this is taken at the Ankara train station, 1931. I cannot tell if Atatürk is leaving for this trip or he or his he, he's already returned from this trip. But this is this photograph is related to this month long, uh, month long trip that actually 
Atatürk sent the telegraph uh, to Inönü. And I really like this, uh, how Atatürk and İsmet İnönü and all the uh, bureaucrats uh, and, and uh, just lined up uh, at the Ankara train station. So here actually uh, this telegraph started a domino effect. So now in 1933, we see the cabinet of ministers. This, this is the executive organ of the, uh, uh, the Turkish parliament uh, devising the establishment of Conservation Council of Monuments. So here, the first staff architect, restoration architect of one of the first female architects in the in Republic in Turkey, Jahid Aksal Tamar. So uh, she now she is the staff architect. She she becomes the uh, she's hired as the staff architect of the Conservation Council of Man Monuments. First, we see her uh, working at the um, Serving Bureau, and then uh, she transitions as the staff architect to Hagia Sophia Museum, and then she transitions to the Topkapı Palace Museum to work as the staff architect for the council. And again, like I said, um, Atatürk's telegraph, uh, like a domino effect, started the um, proliferation of those um, um, historic preservation offices and task forces, but also architectural documentation offices. So in, in, the, in, um, in the state agencies. Here we see the Serving Bureau, the establishment of Serving Bureau in 1936. Serhat Çetintaş is the founding director. Uh, this is under the Minister of Education. In 1944, we see another uh, office, Office of the Monuments, Ülgen serving as the founding director. So uh, in the General Directorate, uh, Directorate of Pius Foundations, then we see the establishment of um, in, uh, in house serving offices, uh, one in uh, Istanbul in 1952 and uh, the other in Ankara in, 19, um, in 1961. So again, um, and I I found this card postcard in the uh, in the South Archive and this uh, Kemal Söylemezoğlu, another architect and academician of the time. A celebrated architect and academician of the time, and also with uh, uh, his wife, Harika Söylemezoğlu. So, uh, and this is Söylemezoğlu's postcard to Ülgen about the Isa Bey Mosque. If, if you've been there today, it, it, it's been restored, but back then uh, it was in a dilapidated shape. And then uh, when he was traveling uh, around Izmir, he came across to Isa Bey Mosque and he uh, sent a, a postcard right away to Ülgen uh, back then. Ülgen was the director of the Office of Monuments in charge of the documentation and preservation projects. And he, uh, Söylem Özoğlu is asking Ülgen if the his structure structure had been surveyed and, and the thorough measured drawing set had been compiled. So this gives us the correlation of um, documentation and uh, protection of built environment. And Söylem Özoğlu and the postcard, how nice it would be to see the mosque repaired and restored. Back again, we're circling back the correlation between uh, documentation and safeguarding our monuments to the future. So uh, before uh, we continue, also I would like to um, talk briefly um, about the contents of the descriptive drawings. So if you uh, read my book, actually, I have a chapter on this, <laughs> but uh, due to the limited uh, time we have today, I'm going to just briefly uh, note what I covered. And if you have any questions, you're more, you more than welcome to ask. Uh, I will be more than happy to answer your questions. So uh, when we look at the measure drawings, actually, um, this is, uh, we see the formal order of descript descriptive drawings. So this is, uh, this is a tradition, at, pardon me, this is a way of seeing, uh, this is a way of representing space, existing space. So this is uh, what we teach architecture students, engineering students today, the student architects, the student engineers. Uh, so the, Descriptive drawing is a way of seeing the 
three dimensional space XYZ coordinates in two dimensional drawings, uh, floor plan, section, and elevations. So, and this, the way of the seeing, the way of representing uh, space uh, was established in the 18th century Europe uh, with the establishment of Euclidean geometry. So, with the positivism, right? So, we're seeing the domination of scientific methods to every domain. And architecture and architectural representation could not escape from that either. So, with the Euclidean geometry, uh, the architectural representations uh, was equated to algebraic analysis of flat surface geometry. And so to two dimensional drawings uh, came to be seen as a precise mathematical description of reality. That's why uh, the, the, the, the descriptive two dimensional drawings the, that was established how to represent space the, the meth this method was established in 18th century uh, with the 18th century Euclidean geometry. But if we go to architecture schools today, we're still teaching our student architects the same uh, way of representing space through two dimensional plan sections and uh, elevation. So there is no escape in that. And also um, uh, I would like to talk about formalism. Uh, formalism. So it's formalism is a way of it's a art critic, if I may say. It's a way of uh, studying art. So again, um, this is rooted in the 19th century. Um, it, uh, this is rooted in the uh, 18th century enlightenment. Um, but we see uh, the domination of this in 19th century and uh, early 20th century modern movement. So uh, formalist thinking uh, is concerned with how art get, artifacts are made and how they look like. In other terms, uh, formalist thinking, form, uh, the, the formalist study uh, is not really interested in the social cultural uh, dynamics that put forward the artifact, but it is more interested about the physical appearance of the artifact. Uh, it could be a chair, it could be a painting, it could be a bookcase, or it could be a building. So uh, when we use formalism, we don't really bring forward uh, the the, um, the social, uh, the culture that brings it forward, but we focus on the mentality of the builder um, and how it looks like, how the, the physical appearances. So again, when we transfer this to architectural forms, uh, then the per this perception culminates in a purely conceptual space, independent from the contingency contingencies of place and time. And we come across to this over and over, again, again, again. That's why the early Republican uh, theorists, they were not referring um, to the time uh, that put these together, um, but they were uh, referring to the mentality of, for instance, architects now as the uh, genius. Uh, they were not talking about the contingence of plates of time, but they were referring in a purely conceptual space. And on and on, when we come to early 20th century, uh, the descriptive floor plans uh, became the essence of architecture because again with the floor plans we are um, that the floor plans there's a reason for the floor plans right the floor plans gives us the idea how the place that space functions right we can have an idea of the progression the horizontal progression of spaces so this gives us an idea of the function so on and on the descriptive floor plans became the to, became to be seen as the gist, the essence, and the spirit of architecture. That's why in all these published monographs, uh, we always come across the floor plans. If we are lucky, we'll have a section or elevation drawing, but all, we always have a floor plan. And uh, when we look at the published monographs, uh, again, we circle back uh, to this mentality. Again, for instance, Sarah Chetintash, 
he writes that the measure drawings uh, put forward the mentality, the rationale, the rationale of the master, of the builder on art, uh, the aesthetics of the builder and the techniques in a very detailed, detailed, detailed manner. Again, we're not talking about um, the culture that brought forward the artifact, but we're talking about um, an architectural form which is not contaminated with the culture, if I may say. Um, so again, uh, this is actually very interesting. Albert, Albert Gabriel, a French architect who documented the such monuments of Turkey uh, with the invitation from uh, a minister of education. So in his book review for Sud Kemaliyet against Türk Mimarisi, and perhaps some of you already read the book, and in this book, uh, Yetkin actually um, or talks about, writes about the evolution of Turkish architecture from the Middle East uh, to, to the current, uh, uh, um, to 1963, uh, to the 1960s. And then all we see is floor plans of some certain buildings. So, and Gabriel celebrates the Etkin's scientific read formalist days in, in the book. Um, and, and he celebrates the way he says that the author uh, directly engages with the building because the uh, author only used the floor plans and does not occupy the uh, with the intentions of the builder at all, right? Or the, with the culture. And Gabriel uh, notes that the first condition to evaluate the structure to understand the meaning embodied in the building and yet can actually is manifesting his mastery in understanding architecture by providing these floor plans of uh, these historic uh, buildings. So we're always circling back to uh, the scientific and formalist uh, measure drawings. And also um, most of the uh, preservationists that we, we meet today, also they were busy uh, giving lectures and publishing. And also they were, uh, what we see, they were always countering um, the perceived understanding of Orientalist European thinkers uh, saying that the Turkish people as a nation, uh, they do not have an architecture, the Turks, they are nomads, uh, they only have tents and whatever they brought forward, they mimic the Byzantine architecture there uh, the, in medieval, uh, medieval Anatolia. And all, on and on, on and on, on and on, uh, all these um, preservations that we meet today, they wrote um, architectural pieces, they published uh, monographs, they published articles, countering these claims of Orientalist uh, thinkers. And Charles Texier, one of the notorious ones, uh, because he, he published, uh, he openly uh, wrote on specific buildings and um, saying that uh, the Turks, they are nomads and they only have tents. And um, this is the Orhan Ghazi Mosque uh, in, in Bursa. And Suna, please jump in because um, he has a, she, Suna has a book published on, on the Bursa, uh, on the monuments of Bursa, at dear Suna Chapta. So takes here actually due to the inverted T plan of this building, it says uh, this resembles a church, you know, it resembles a Byzantine church. And Ivardi's Ekrem Ivardi official reply to counter text here was a measured plan of the building with uh, dimensions and annotations. And he Ivardi writes that to provide material evidence for the pure Turkish form of the mosque, I annotate the substantial amount of dimensions in the measured drawing. Again, the measured drawing is a scientific record of the historic uh, building on paper. And here, actually, this is Ivardi's official reply um, to, taxi, uh, to, to counter uh, Texier's notorious claims on uh, that Turks do not, have not uh, brought any uh, architecture forward. Uh, before I finish, also, I would like to talk about the National Architecture Seminar at the Academy. Um, um, of course, in the book, I um, discuss this with more details, but we cannot have a presentation without talking about the National Architecture Seminar, 
uh, which set out the Hakka Adam. Um, actually, uh, he uh, Aigley, Ernst Aigley, uh, handed over this course to uh, Sedat Hakka Adam. Um, so for Adam, the Turkish house is inherently modern. And at his at the National Architecture Seminar, uh, his students um, at the seminar traveled across Turkey and he, they made major drawings of the Turkish warning, warning color architecture and they published uh, and they exhibited their major drawings at the uh, National Architecture Seminar at the student exhibition at the academy end of the, at the end of the school year. And so, and Aldam's primary legacy entails that uh, he codified and theorized the monumental, uh, with this monumental documentation work uh, to define the rational characteristics of the Turkish house. Again, according to uh, Aldam, uh, the Turkish house is inherently modern uh, because of the structural, um, the rational structuralism embodied in the house, the elevated floor plans, uh, the modular form, and of all other elements. Of course, um, um, Adam, like all the other preservationists that we are talking today, uh, he was a positivist and he is, and all of them a supporter of modern architecture. And no wonder Adam used the floor plans of um, vernacular houses, vernacular architecture across Turkey to compare and to show actually these buildings, these structures, they are modern. He just used the floor plans uh, to compare different um, buildings. And here uh, I brought two uh, students' work from the seminar. Uh, on the left, this is uh, uh, this is Ali Sami and Ulgan's Sevesh Pasha the uh, the the kiosk in Istanbul, one of uh, Sinan's only remaining. Um, Residential architect uh, examples of residential architecture, and the other one is Fit uh, the Argons Ankara Evleri, the residential architecture from Ankara. Uh, let's talk about the national cultivation of the built environment. Before, and sometimes I feel like um, I'm a broker record talking about the history, a Turkish history thesis all the time, writing about it in all my publications. I always have a couple of uh, paragraphs or a page, or every time I give a lecture, I talk about the Turkish history thesis. Find out sometimes I'm like a parrot repeating myself, but this is very important because um, uh, this is the nationalist wing, right? The, this is where the heroic feelings in the earlier public comes from, uh, the Turkish history thesis. And I'm always afraid to say my age, uh, but perhaps we have uh, somebody in the audience who got the tale of the um, Turkish history thesis. Perhaps they read uh, in the elementary school, high school, college. Maybe they uh, they had history books in the curriculum that they had the uh, you know crumbles of the Turkish history thesis. So what did the Turkish history thesis told us? Uh, that was a state propaganda. It put the Turkish Turkish race and the Turkish civilization at the forefront of the world historical development, right, through the ages. So what do we mean that? So with the Turkish history of thesis, now we're referring to a pre-Ottoman ethnic group called Turks, right, who migrated from Central Asia, uh, moved westwards and populated the rest of the world. And uh, this is... Uh, very important because with the Turkish history thesis, the effects of the, uh, the implementation of the Turkish history thesis to the modern history preservation movement was paramount and long, long standing because the Turkish history thesis assigned highest priority the document and protect historic properties of national significance. So we see that's why we see. Uh, preservationists or, or lay people uh, scaling the buildings up to the roofs, the attics of the buildings, making major drawings or rallying around certain buildings to prevent uh, mutilation or prevent demolition. So the thesis assigned highest priority to document the, and protect the historic properties of 
national significance. And that's very important. And um, for instance, in uh, Iznik the Turk Eserler and another monograph of Ulyan, uh, where he actually has architectural descriptions of the buildings, but also he published his uh, measure, measure drawings. He openly writes that he's publishing these measure drawings uh, of historic properties to elevate lack of publications on the Turkish history, right? Turkish history of thesis, Turkish history, the Turkish history of the ancient city, and to secure funds, to secure grants. The, Republic has meager funds, and they have to be careful allocating these uh, uh, this um, limited funds to certain buildings, certain projects, right? But also the Turkish history of thesis um, also uh, opened the door open. What makes national? Okay, what means a national monument? what makes a, a historic monument. And that's where the fluidity uh, comes in. Uh, because of course the Turkish monuments, uh, they are national because they are Turkish, but also the Turkish history thesis brings that flexibility, if I may say, what makes national, what makes significant or not. For instance, this is very important and this is very interesting. And, and this is uh, the, photograph of um, the Iznik Mosque. It's a repurposed uh, Byzantine church, uh, uh, the Hagia Sophia church in Iznik. So we have three Hagia Sophias, one in Istanbul, one in Iznik, and one in Trabzon. And uh, Suna, please jump in uh, if I'm missing anything. Um, and this is the 16th century edition of the Iznik's Hagia Sophia Mosque. Again, it was a Byzantine church. Uh, Nakia, right? The Byzantine name of the city in Iznik. And this is very important because uh, this is where the economical, uh, ecumenical council in the fourth century gathered the council of Nakia. And, uh, and it's very, this building was very important for Orthodox Christians. And also this building was important for the Turks after the conquest because the Turks uh, converted the church into a mosque and Sinan added the, um, the, uh, the minaret, the minbar, we see them, widened the interior arches, and it, it served the function of a mosque in the, in the Ottoman times. So, and Ulgan, and what we see, uh, Ulgan, uh, um, here he refers the term, um, uh, the Byzantified, uh, the Turkified Byzantine architecture. Again, this is very significant. And he writes that actually he wants to, uh, he, he published this monograph to protect, to uh, secure grants for their protection. And then he writes that due to the important life cycles of the Hagia Sophia Mass, the repurposed, uh, repurposed Byzantine church in the Byzantine times and in the Turkish times, um, that has to be protected and refers as um, Turkified Byzantine architecture. And we circle back to Turkified Byzantine architecture again with Kemal Altan. Um, he uses the term, and Kemal Altan is interesting because um, he is an architect, he is working at the Istanbul Archaeological Museums. So in his daily life, his task was documentation of the antiquities and the Byzantine uh, heritage in the city. But also we know that he's strolling through the streets of Istanbul and he's documenting um, architectural heritage before it is lost to oblivion. So he's also protecting, he's also documenting the Byzantine works, but also he's documenting the Turkish um, monuments. And, we, and he writes about this. Unfortunately, we don't have these field notes with us anymore, uh, but perhaps in one day somebody uh, will find his Altan's field notes in a forgotten archive, in a forgotten folder. But he says that uh, the Turks blessed the Byzantine monuments with the architecture program of Islam, and they carved these mementos with the beauty of the Turkish spread. So these are also Turkified uh, Byzantine architecture. 
But of course, that's where the fluidity comes in. So not everybody is on the same boat. So Hakka Ayavardi ridicules the concept that all the architectural landscape in layered in Anatolia, the Hittites, the Phrygian, Lydians, Romans or Byzantines, they all exhibited the building traditions of the Turkish race. But he says that uh, the Turks and their architecture came from Central Asia and the Turkish architecture is not related to any of the earlier civilizations in Anatolia or the Byzantines. So and actually it is interesting if you read more about Ayvardi's work uh, in some medieval uh, buildings uh, that we see some reminiscence of uh, Byzantine building elements because, you know, right, we have the uh, Byzantine craftsmen working in those buildings in medieval Anatolia and also we have this fluidity, the migration of these populations, the movement. So it's hard to differentiate or dissect the building into certain terms. But so anytime um, Ivar sees, and these are very smart people, you know, um, uh, Ivar de Ulgan, Tamar, all of them, uh, and very celebrated architects, and, uh, and they, they, they are thinkers. And every time he sees a Byzantine element, he says, oh, okay, that should be a Greek uh, mason working in the area, or that's a, a Greek mason traveling between cities. So, uh, but, that, but that's Turkish. Again, Çetin uh, was more or less in the same boat as uh, Ayvardi with uh, assigning highest proper, uh, priority uh, to the Turkish monuments of national significance. And also, um, Çetintaş uh, reminds us that actually, um, according to the Republic, there is not a class difference between a mosque to a madrasa, but, uh, but there is this collection of Turkish monuments which shows the separate patronages in the history of Turkish culture and the Turkish civilization. Uh, so I would like to conclude uh, with a couple of words. And thank you so much for listening to me and uh, thanks so much for uh, being with me and listening to this lecture. Please let me know if you have any questions, I will be more than happy to answer. And But what we saw so far in the early Republic, archival building documentation became a byproduct of the uh, movement, of, movement of historical preservation. Measured drawings, they are scientific documents. They were seen as scientific documents replicating the building on paper. And in spite of the uniform sanctions of the national monument, we see that flexibility and uh, fluidity among among different preservationists. And also, um, I know it's I always tell this to my students. We're here, right, in two thousand twenty-four, and sometimes it is easy for us to critique perhaps uh, the the peers of, of the you know. The, the thinkers of the of the era. But perhaps if I was born in 1920s, I would have had similar, you know, line of work, I, or I would have had uh, similar uh, thinking. So we have, we cannot separate the uh, preservationists, the pioneers, the thinkers uh, from the architectural culture that they belong to. So even though it's uh, for us, it's, it's easier for us to critique or, you know, just to have an opinion, uh, please, let's not forget that their drafted lines have guided generations of architects and scholars, including us. I owe all my work to them, right? And uh, and we uh, and that helps their work with their work. Now we can get a uh, achieve a deeper understanding of the building environment. Uh, thank you so much. So, Sana, you have. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah. Uh, it was brilliant, um, I must say. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, so instead of giving everyone an overview of what you had discussed, mm -hmm. I decided to go ahead with a couple of questions. Um, and I think before we do anything else, we should greet our guests who are joining us from elsewhere. Uh -huh. Um, I was very timid when we started because I was uh, rushing from Aydın to Kushada, so where I'm uh, leading the excavation project. So my apologies for not greeting our guests properly. So um, again, hello to everyone. Uh, we have a couple of questions, but uh, I think uh, using the moderator 
uh, hat. I'm gonna ask uh, one or two questions and then I'm gonna turn the floor over to further questions. Um, I think before we do anything else, maybe I can ask you uh, to walk us through um, how you decided to write this book, because it's, uh, uh, I think it's related to your academic training because you are trained as an architect. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering, you know, how you came up with this topic um, and how did you come up with the framework as well in the book? Thank you. Oh. Oh wow! Okay, <laughs> here we go. So okay, it's gonna it's going to take some time because you're asking me to reflect on the to the last twenty years, and now you all know my age, right? A couple of you guys age my <laughs> so wow, that's gonna take some time. Okay, let's go back to my years as a student architect as Mimar Sinan Fine uh, Fine Arts University. So when I was a student architect there at Mimar Sinan. I remember vividly that I was always drawn to the architectural documentation and historic preservation uh, classes. So when I started the uh, graduate program at Koch University, and back then it was the, my program was called um, the Anatolian Civilizations and Cultural Heritage Management. I had the greatest opportunity to work with uh, uh, scholars of the time, but of course I had the greatest opportunity to work with dear, my dear uh, professor and my friend now, uh, Lucian Thais Shenojak, uh, she was the, my thesis advisor and, you know, um, and she was, she's always been my mentor. And she was the project manager of the documentation and conservation of the Sedir Bahir and Kumkale uh, military fortresses in Gelibolu. So then I was awarded uh, with the ICOMOS International um, Student Exchange Program on a federal scholarship from the US government. And I landed in New York City, documenting the stage of liberty, right? You know, from Gelibolu to, um, from Istanbul, Koch University to stage of liberty. And uh, I was a hair intern, historic American engineering record. And there actually I learned how to use the laser scanner. So then I came, uh, returned to Koch. I finished my I defended my master's thesis. So my master's thesis was on the documentation project of the Seydir Bahir military fortress and the Stage of Liberty. So after I graduated from Koch University, I started my doctoral degree at Texas a and University in the College of Architecture. And Lucien and I, we looked at all the programs together, the doctoral programs, and she was really, she was phenomenal and was helping me. Um, so we looked at the programs and then a and um, the College of Architecture, uh, it was one of the few architectural schools that offered digital surveying technologies. So by when I, when I was writing my uh, doctoral dissertation, you would expect, right? So I've been working all these um, documentation projects all around the world. I worked in Egypt, I worked in France, I worked in Turkey, you know, it is, but I, I worked in, uh, I was laser scanning. I was teaching archaeology students in Belize how to do, you know, the analog. And then the more I'm in the field working, I had to have, I started to have some questions. So, and my dissertation was concerned with the uh, phenomenological, uh, you know, the architectural documentation as a way of uh, academic setting for the student architects, for archaeologists too. So now I'm sure you have so many uh, interns in your program uh, in the in the field in the dig with you. So and do, with the, in the architecture schools, recording and documentation, um, this is an active learning method for teaching students and students learning. Uh, the scale, the proportion, the materials, because the students, they are gathering surface measurements and they are creating field notes. And this is an active learning process for the students. But once we start the scanner, um, actually we're eliminating this active learning process and we're scanning the building surface meters away. We're not even touching the surface. We're not even going near. And we're making the measured drawings at the office without even looking at the building working with the point cloud. So my dissertation was on HAPS, Historic American Building Survey, uh, which this is a federal program, just like here, I was an intern at the Stage of Liberty. 
a federal program that has been active since 1933, believe it or not. And so, so the architecture schools across the US, um, the students, the student teams, they uh, document the local piece of local architecture wherever they live and they make mission drawing sets and they submit it to the Library of Congress. Likewise, architects or architectural offices uh, at by, byproduct of their work, also they uh, submit their measure drawings to Library of Congress. And believe it or not, I have measure drawings there too in the Library of Congress. My drawings of Statue of Liberty, if you know you want to look one day, they're in the um, HAPS collection, hair collection, Library of Congress. So after I wrote my thesis, I defended my thesis. After I graduated, um, and I began to wonder after I, uh, if we have a similar program like HAPS in early Republic in Turkey, because we have all these heroic feelings, we have all this publication, uh, and you know more, right? I mean, I don't want to step in what, but all these archeological excavations uh, that the state is sponsoring all the monographs. And and, I, and then actually, then I came across to Alistair Ulgan archive at SALT, and Jahid Aksal Tamar's uh, uh, uh, archive at Koch University, the Snakrat Library at Koch University. And believe it or not, uh, apparently it was Ulgan's drawings uh, when I was a student architect at um, Mimar Sinan. Every time we would work in a, a studio project, somebody would bring Ulgan's those measured drawings. We would use that as a background or to uh, use it as to gauge the scale proportion of our project ideas on paper. So, and it was Ulgan, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so when I saw those drawings and I dealt further, I realized that although uh, in the current scholarship, uh, many bright scholars, there are many bright, um, um, you know, scholarship, expanded scholarship, nobody really touched, touched the base. Nobody really focused on the measured service of the era. Mm -hmm. And academically speaking, everything I have been working on architectural documentation from the field to the theory, everything channeled me to the writing of this book. And here I am. Yeah. Um, my next question would be, uh, because you are an architect and yes. I'm an archaeologist and architectural historian, I think the way you're looking at drawings, measured drawings, is very different from the way I look at them. Okay. Because I, for example, I use all those drawings in order to describe the buildings that I'm working on, like their plans, their facade elevations, and so on. Mm -hmm. What you're doing, doing in your book, I think, which is very valuable and important, is the fact that you're putting the background info and the cultural context that took all those uh, preservation people to go to those buildings and make those drawings. To yeah. me, I think it all starts with a drawing when an architect is designing a building. Mm -hmm. And if we use uh, Frank Gehry's uh, signed yeah. napkin sketches, it That's all it. starts <laughs> with a drawing. It also ends with a drawing because those guys, your guys, they are all drawing oh. those ancient buildings. And, uh -huh. you know, they are just putting them into a place where they could be preserved. Oh, yes. But again, yeah. right? Uh, again, uh, so we, I touched the base on uh, the positivism, Euclidean geometry we talked about. So now we know that how did those two-dimensional drawings came. So that's the purpose. That's why um, when we are actually uh, drawing a two-dimensional drawing, we're always truncating, we're always eliminating some aspect of it. For instance, like the drawings, right? You, you, you're you preparing for the dig, for the excavation. If you're working on a floor plan, that means that you're only interested in the horizontal details and you're eliminating, you're leaving the uh, vertical element uh, information to something else. So you're focusing on a certain point, a point of interest, and you're leaving the rest out. So you're always leaving something out. So it's not, and that's how we were trained. And that's how we train still architects in architecture schools. But also with the book, and thank you so much for this remark, I try to bring the concept because it's easy for us to critique what has been done in 1930s or 40s, but that's what they knew, right? And I think it's important for us 
to bring the concept to the foreground, uh, foreground to um, weave to to weave that missing link. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let okay. me let me throw in one of the questions coming from the audience so that I okay. don't dominate the discussion. It's coming from Burkai Pasin. Uh, he says, congratulations on this extensive research. And Thank his you. question is the following. Architectural documentation can be very ideological, depending mm -hmm. on what to and not to document for historic preservation. So two questions. One, today, most of the Ottoman heritage is officially recorded and preserved by the Pius Foundation mm -hmm. and the Council of Monuments as we have also seen in your research. Preserving and documenting only the monuments, um, hold on, um, considered national, but not ordinary. Public buildings is also ideological in terms of the selection criteria of the expert. Do you agree with that question? The second question is, there is no state organization for the protection of modern heritage, except for the attempts of Dokomomo in Turkey, for the last 20 years. What kind of an alternative model do you think could be followed for the documentation of modern architectural heritage? Oof, let's start. Uh, I'm going to start with the second question. I'm sure. going to uh, proceed to the first one. Uh, Burkai Pasin, uh, he, with the first one, could you please rephrase the last two lines for the first question? Um, the For the first question. Mm -hmm. um, the, the pious foundations are recording most of the Ottoman mm -hmm. heritage. Um, and preserving and documenting only the monuments considered national, but not ordinary. And okay. public buildings is also ideological in terms of the selection okay. criteria. Of that the circles act. back to my post. Okay. Yeah. Yes, that circles back, but I want to be sure with the word ordinary. Okay. So the second one, uh, thank you so much, Burkai Pasin. We haven't met in person, but uh, although virtual, it's great uh, to have this exchange of ideas. So Dong, uh, the more... <laughs> Documentation is fine, uh, but preservation of modern architecture uh, is difficult and is, is, is, is challenging because of the materials, right? So because when we look at modern architecture, uh, the materials they put together, most of them, they were experimental, right? So uh, when we're in 2024, um, when we look at the projects here in the US, for instance, in I live in Dallas, and Dallas is uh, famous for the mid-century modern architecture. So I can just take my students and just go to a residence, just a family lives there and a piece of modern architecture. But it's uh, tricky because most of the time the materials and the practices that they put the modern architecture together with architects and designers, they were those materials, they were experimental. And most of them, they don't, they didn't even, survive. So uh, when we actually uh, preserve, uh, first of all, we try to preserve with the authentic materials or as, as authentic as possible. But oh, of course, we are using modern technologies too, but we try to honor the authentic uh, materials mimic. And if we have to, if we cannot, we hide the uh, contemporary materials in, in the background or even if I cannot, uh, we have to differentiate the new and the old. That's pretty much the logic of the modern preservation movement. But for the modern movement, um, modern architecture, most of these materials, they failed away anyways. Right? So you cannot just replace the failing um, elements, right? Again, that again, that, so you have to manufacture certain elements to, uh, to, to provide the, uh, the loss, the eventual loss in oblivion. So yes, uh, and also in the US, if I if I may say, uh, modern architecture is ignored, overlooked, and that's pretty much the first thing you would go because I think again we couldn't really get over from the materialistic view or, or um, um, historic preservation that values age, right? So if you look at it, uh, a building from 1970s is modern in the sense that maybe the tale of modern architecture, but it's not old, right? So it, it, it's easy to lose them. 
I don't know what to say, <laughs> to, to, to be honest. Uh, I think what we can do, uh, educate people, educate our students, educate lay people uh, about modern architecture, uh, uh, being part of the task force commissions, uh, putting uh, modern architecture to the fore foreground, um, uh, rally around buildings. Uh, I think that, that's a, a, a provide a grassroots movement of modern architecture. Uh, that will be the solution uh, because preservation, the education for history preservation, if you only hear about history preservation in college, that's too late. Okay, so I think, and it's really idealistic, dear Burkai Pessin, but I think uh, the value of history preservation, it has to be taught in the elementary school. That way we can influence, inf you know, we, we can um, talk about the value of recycling buildings. Don't demolish that. Don't build new recycling, right? Recycling buildings from 1980s, 1970s, 1960s, even 2000, that is green energy. So I think that starts at an early age. And here, if I circle back to my book, although all the preservationists we met today, they lived in the era of modern architecture. So they were building them, they were designing them. Uh, but also all of them, they wrote about the importance of a grassroots movement and writing memos to the Minister of Education. We have to add classes of history preservation in elementary schools. We have to do this, we have to do that. Preservation, the ethical preservation starts in the family, right? In the household, not in college. So, and for the first, yes, history preservation always has an idealistic tendency. And I'm choosing uh, my words carefully, okay? So I don't want to get into trouble. <laughs> Yes, uh, there's a lot of preservation, history preservation work, repairs going on in Turkey and elsewhere here too. And here, history preservation is political too, okay? And if I may, um, uh, for instance, here, um, what is in the forefront is the what happened in the American history, the unfortunate, the dark histories, surrounding the African-Americans, right? And the slave history, if I may say. So here we have all these conversations too, uh, because uh, here the African-Americans, they don't want to see the buildings, the historic buildings that are associated with a difficult past, uh, which is associated with slavery, unfortunate. But also that is part of the American culture too, right? you cannot erase that. And one by one, um, here in Dallas, elsewhere, um, there is a, a big rallying against the statues around the uh, or the buildings associated with the, these difficult paths. And one by one, the cities or uh, state institutions they are removing those uh, big statues, you know, associated mm -hmm. with. The, so it's all this, but you may like it or you may like it it's not it's just what is going on in turkey right now uh, it's political right now but in 20 years you don't know what is the trend you know what i mean so as a preservationist as an architect we have to value we have to value every phase of our past and okay i live in the us but also i'm turkish and Turkish history is very important for me. And I'm always proud of my country and I'm always proud of my heritage. That's why I wrote this book, right? I could have written it in a topic, but even, even though we like it or not, even though a building is associated in Turkey um, with something, a difficult past, a heritage past, a, a dark history, or maybe it's not trending at the moment, um, still we have to value the, the heritage, uh, the, the architectural heritage, because it represents a certain story we may not know today, but maybe in 20 years we're going to know about it. Did I answer your question? Okay. <laughs> Thank um, you. I am going to go to the questions from the audience because we have been getting a few more. Okay. Uh, there is a question from Yashmak Kemal. I'm not sure whether it's a true name or it's just a nickname. Okay. Um, 
So the question is, architectural documentation, including plans, sections, elevations, and even enlarged details are tools for architectural imagination. Yes. Huh? Um, and I'm reading verbatim. She says, or he says, I think that the difference is in how individual researchers or architects, architects imagine architecture also affect the final product of architectural documentation in addition to the purpose of the document they produce. Uh, so this subject you study also sheds light on the researchers themselves. What do you think about that? Oh, yes, I cannot, like, like I said, right? Uh, I'm an yeah. architect, I have artificial training, I'm teaching preservation classes, I'm teaching design classes. So I always have a bias, everybody has a bias. So let's face this, everybody has a personal bias or a cultural bias. Uh, I mean, and I'm not using bias in a, uh, in a, in, in, in a, as a, uh, you know, um, bad word, if I may say, right? Uh, everybody has a bias and it's, it's important uh, to embrace that. Uh, but um, that's what they taught us uh, when I was a doctoral student at uh, Texas a University. One of the classes I got, uh, I mean, I, I, I, I enrolled, um, it was um, research methodologies. And especially for people, scholars working on interpretive areas, uh, social studies, um, archival research, uh, it's important for us to be clear about where we're coming from and just note that maybe in the first chapter, in the methodologies, where we're coming from and that could affect the way we look at the data because we are the scholars, we are the authors and we make data. All these archival materials, all these drawings, they're just data, right? Suna, just like the drawings, it's just data. But when we read them, when we interpret them, we make them information. So yeah. that's the book, right? So everything was data, but now it's information. And in that process from data to information, it's inevitable that we project our personal biases. Again, I'm not saying that in a bad, bad way, but it's important for us to be able to clear about that. Mm -hmm. And me, a Turkish history thesis or uh, it's important because again, you're going to get my age, but I think I captured the last of those, you know, ne I, I didn't read that history books, but I can now I go back and in, in elementary school, I remember here, here and there, the crumbles and also Ulgan's drawing when I was a student architect and um, uh, Mimar's not, I still remember when we were all working on our projects, all these drawing sheets. Oh, I don't, I didn't know where that came from, but somebody would bro brought it over and then we would use those drawings. So personal, so that's how I could relate. Did mm -hmm. I answer your question? Uh, I, I think so there. I don't see okay. any other comments. Okay. Um, I, I'm just going to interject before I carry on reading the questions from the audience, uh, just to follow up with what we have been talking about. Um, I think one of the th things that you achieve in your book is to talk about different um, preservation figures like Ulgen or Iverde yes. and we, we all know that they come from like different walks of lives. Mm -hmm. They have different backgrounds, family backgrounds, education backgrounds. They all work for a, you know, for the same cause. It's like the national agenda. But yes. still, I think in the way that they are dealing with the buildings and they are drawing them, like when you compare Çetintaş with Ulgen, you mm -hmm. see that the way that they are looking at the Turkish uh, evidence is like completely different. You see, maybe like you understand how secular they are or how conservative yes. they are, mm -hmm. like Iverdi versus Çetintaş. I think it's very valuable and they are achieving this in a way with the drawings that they are doing and how they are telling us about those drawings. So, um, yeah, I just want to interject that. Is that a question or a comment? No, no, no, it's just a comment. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have a question mark. Uh, we have a couple of thank you notes from Gülçin Janja and who else? Filiz Atay. And we have a question from Ihsan Yeneroğlu. Okay. He says, uh, from your research, I can see that you had, you had changed to study uh, architectural cultural heritage and their documentations. 
What I understand is that there is no special study program for it. Just wondering if there is any program or department to study only in historical building research in Turkey. For example, it's like the German uh, Bau Forschung, or is it part of the study program within architecture or archaeology? Can you oh, say anything about the oh, departmental divisions? Okay, um, I mean, um, I have to admit, I am not familiar with the structures in the architecture schools uh, at the moment. Um, I, uh, you know, or the archaeology departments, you know, with the Ersuna, we, we exchanged, uh, we have overlapping work together, overlapping studies. I have to admit, I'm not familiar with the structure in the Turkish architecture schools at the moment, uh, but in terms of the the, uh, the programs in the U.S., uh, I think the uh, he is asking about the grad studies, right? Graduate studies, right? Okay. So, um, so what happens uh, if you are applying for the graduate studies? Uh, you have to be careful because, again, you are applying to the umbrella. For instance, when I applied to my doctoral degree, I applied to the School of Architecture, right? So just like the School of Architecture at Mina, Mina, uh, Mimarsna Fine Arts University. But um, I knew that there were a couple of professors whom uh, one is Robert Ward and he was my dissertation chair. The other is David Woodcock. Um, I was his TA teaching assistant. I was teaching classes there. Um, you apply to the general umbrella and you and the structure could have um, you know different different different departments. Every school is different, but basically you apply to work with a certain person. okay? So uh, because if you're applying for a grad school, mo most likely you're applying for a scholarship too or a grant too and it's and Suna, you know, is resourceful. And you know, Suna, you know, you, you went to grad school in the US too. So, um, you, you're, so you're not only you're applying for a grad school, but you're applying for a scholarship, meaning that uh, the professors they have their their certain but the, the departments they have their certain budgets. But you have to be clear. So the short answer: No, there is not a program in architectural documentation. Okay, or building. Um, Columbia has building conservation and heritage conservation. Texas a &M University has Center for Heritage Conservation. University of Texas in Austin, they have a history preservation program. So some schools, they have certain history preservation programs. So it's easier for the applicant to navigate himself or herself. But some schools, they don't have those uh, specialized preservation programs or schools. Uh, but they have certain professors who are working in those areas because uh, every school is different. Um, so you have to be clear what you're applying for, who you are, who want to work with, okay? And also because that means that the school is going to invest on you in terms of the tuition and in terms of the uh, assistantship. Um, uh, the short answer, yeah, no, there is not a program on architecture documentation, but that's a lucky day. Uh, there are a lot of professors who want to, <laughs> who want to work uh, with grad students on uh, different topics on documentation. Yes. I think it's like a very wide range. Um, Question? Um, Institutions institution like dedicated to historic yes. preservation in the US. Yes. But not, as um, you said, not on architectural documentation. No, ar no architectural documentation. Yeah. Um, so we have two more questions. And apologies if there's too much background noise. Um, and, okay. So Isan Yenerol is thanking you for the answer. Shebnem Dönbekçi is the next person in line. Okay. Uh, she's asking uh, because she works on the historiography of the Byzantine on of the Byzantine studies in Turkey. She says she has observed uh, that much of the work carried on Byzantine architectural Byzantine cultural heritage by preservation specialists, especially graduate works, are not considered as mainstream Byzantine research, and they remain underutilized. 
she would like to get your thoughts on this um, and she thanks you as well oh thank you okay never give up i always tell my students never ever give up okay uh, and go and go publishing go working go uh believe in yourself and go on with the work okay so of course if we're lucky we get a grant with that work sometimes we're not happy you know we're not happy you know we're putting all that labor <laughs> and we're not paid for that but uh, never never give up and here um suna may i uh talk about my coming book here is that sure the yeah, oh. we can. Yeah, before before you do that, uh, Sarah, we have one more question, and let yes, me. Um, can I bundle? Uh, sure. Question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So yeah, that's sure. what I said. Don't give up. Don't give up. That's okay. that's very <laughs> timely. Yeah, please go okay. ahead. So that's yeah. very timely. So now, actually, um, when I was working on this one, I compiled so many documents on Byzantine art and architecture, and I'm not a Byzantine historian. Okay. Um, you know, I when I was at Koch University in my grad in the grad school, of course, I uh, I took uh, classes on Byzantine art and architecture, but I never defined myself as a Byzantine historian. But as an architect, of course, I have a certain point of view. So now, when when I was working on this book, I compiled all these different drawings and and and and, and documents, and I saw that actually, the preservationists. Um, so the, the perceived understanding that um, to date the published information entailed the position that the state-led preservation movement in Turkey, right, the preservation movement in Turkey, it's always led by the state, not now perhaps, but in the beginning it's state-led uh, state agencies and the, the published information entailed that the position that the preservation movement operated without allocating adequate funding and methodical, methodological strategies for the protection of the Byzantine architecture. But the primary materials I came across um, provide evidence otherwise. So what I came across, and although I cannot pinpoint every rift or move anything, it's impossible for us to do. Um, but overall, the preservationists I, we met today and many more they managed to find a meaningful way, meaningful way for the Byzantine architecture to be validated in the historic preservation movement. And I saw, and I came across documents, they rallied around certain monuments, um, just, you know, don't demolish this, Let's, uh, do the repairs, let's save this, let's not save it. Of course, there are, uh, it, there's fluidity too. So now my other book, now second book is on this. So. Uh, it's about the advocacy and institutional challenges uh, of preserving Byzantine architecture in Turkey. And again, I'm looking at 1923 to 1970s, because 1970s is where Jahida Aksal Tamar, one of the uh, early uh, first female art restoration architects in Turkey, and uh, she orchestrated a very high profile uh, preservation project of the monuments in Istanbul. It started with the, um, the Congress, right? The Byzantine Studies Congress in 1955. But it, because of the gradual um, piecemeal um, grant situation to allocate for the monuments, it lasted till the 1970s. That's why I am thinking 1970s for that symbolic date. So that, for instance, that's why, you know, you could say that it's not going to be a mainstream book, <laughs> you're right, based on that, but never give up. So you ne never know what you're going to come across. And we're all, um, when we when were in grad school or when we're publishing, of course, it was years ago, when I was a and my professor told me, when you start grad school, you all think that, and I thought that you're gonna change something, okay? You're a mover and shaker. Yes, we're all mover shakers. But actually, you're a, you're a water drop, right? A drop in, in the ocean, okay? But it, it, it makes triple, triple effect. I mean, so <laughs> I'm not saying that we're not important. I'm just saying that, uh, you know, it just makes, it can make a difference. Did I answer your question? Probably, yeah. I don't see any comments from Shebnam. Okay. Uh, but as an inside info, uh, as a person who knows Shebnam personally, 
I should say that uh, because she is a mature student, uh, <laughs> she decided to, you know, uh, do a PhD on Byzantine studies oh, wow. uh, quite la later on in her life. Um, although, you know, that also dates Shebnam here in the school. <laughs> um, she's one of the per people, you know, who never gives up. So um, never give up. <laughs> yeah, she doesn't give up. There we go. Go for yeah. it. <laughs> but I think this uh, new book idea, Sarah, is it's very, um, I think it's a very smart move, uh, given that, you know, you wrote this monograph on the architectural mm -hmm. documentation, um, focusing on the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Mm -hmm. um, you are, again, going back to the beginning, the turning point in the Turkish history, yeah, uh, when they start looking at the Byzantine monuments as well. They are documenting them, preserving them. So it's, uh, it's going to be a very complementing study, I think. Side and by side. We see the um we see some hidden points, right, in my presentation, but you will come across some points there in the book too. Uh that so that lays the background. But I'm just moving forward. I'm just going to focus on uh the documentation and preservation of Byzantine architecture because they document Byzantine architecture too. There is one more question from ZOA. Um, mm -hmm. And she is, or he is, wondering how examining historical buildings, spatially and materially, can be beneficial for today's sustainable architecture. Oh, wow, that's a good question. For instance, uh, thank you so much for asking. Uh, so now, actually, um, architectural documentation, we're documenting buildings, so we're learning, right? We're learning uh, from those buildings we, where we want to learn. So, for instance, uh, I don't know how hot the weather is in Turkey right now, but it's a cooling, you know, cooling September day in Dallas, and we had really, really hot days like Mersin or, you know, in, in Turkey. So, Texas is, I think, in the same. So, we, we document, of course, we're making an architectural record, but also we're documenting the building to study the buildings. And one thing is, um, for instance, we're documenting, I'm going to, just going to give an example. We're documenting a building um, made 200 years ago, okay? Or, um, and there is no HVAC. They don't have any air conditioning units, right? They don't have any um, cooling, heating apparatus, right? Not, not, none of those devices, but the, the documenting that house from 200 years ago that actually gives us an idea how um, they um, how they managed uh, to circulate the air, the breeze, or the hot air, depending on the weather, inside the building. So again, that gives us a hint, right? Uh, that gives us a hint of how they sold that that uh, circulation of air, make it uh, warmer or make it cooler either putting a fountain or even making those chimneys that will bring in, bring out the hot weather. And yes, that's sustainable because they didn't put those HVAC units that we're using today, which is not sustainable. Uh, so, and it gives them an opportunity to look those natural methods, practices, and it gives us an opportunity more and more integrate those to our daily activities, not just opening two windows across getting the breeze, <laughs> right? And, yeah. right? So I, that gives an opportunity. Yeah, I mean, today um, we had a site visit to one of the sites in Aydın and it's an ancient city called Tralles, the mm -hmm. old city in Aydın. Um, and I was visiting the site with classical archeologists. Mm -hmm. They simply hate Byzantine period. They say, oh, oh yeah. the Byzantines, Use marble to come up with uh, lime and other building products. They were just, you know, just destroying what was classical, what was beautiful. And it, I, I just said, you know, it's sustainable for them. It's, mm -hmm. it's like an easier way of coming up with uh, building material. It is building they material. That's so, the trick. And also yeah. the north and south uh, orientation of the. If you go to the um, houses in Ephesus, right, Suna. They have the south and north orientation houses because they knew when it's the summertime they're gonna live in the north part 
when it's the winter time, they're going to live in the south part of the same house. I mean, it, it, it, it's so these kind of decisions and for the limestones too, because it, limestone is a good insulator, right? Material. Um, so it's insulating the cold air or the warm air, right? It's a good insulator. So whatever you have outside, you don't get it anymore inside. Uh, your microphone is off now. Yes. Ah, okay. Um, I'm just checking out to see whether there are any other questions or comments. I don't see any. I'm, I just want to ask our audience whether they have any comments to follow up or questions. Or uh, Sarah, do you have anything to add? Any oh, other no. remarks? Thank you so much no? for inviting me. It was a great, I had the greatest pleasure to uh, all the virtually meeting you and all the uh, attendees today. And I see some, actually I'm checking the list and I see some familiar names. Thank you so much for uh, spending this nice evening, my, my lunch time, not your evening <laughs> <laughs> with us. And, and I'm hoping to meet in another event as well. Sure. I mean, we, we had like a very nice crowd. Uh, at some point we reached 50 people. Uh, including us so uh, on a September evening uh, it was I think it was a very good attendance um, I also want to thank you Sarah for writing that beautiful uh, very oh, you know thought-provoking book so that you know I was able to read it and also thanks for inviting me to moderate this uh, session oh, no. thank you yeah? thank you so I'm gonna turn the floor over to Irem Hanım uh, and thank you Irem Hanım the floor is yours Irem Hanım, we, we can't hear you. Maybe your line is off. <laughs> Most probably. <laughs> now you can hear me, right? Uh, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. And I would like to also thank uh, you the, for the attendees for the contribution. Uh, Anamed Library Talks will continue in October. Uh, you can follow the details in our website and social media accounts. Uh, thank you very much again and good evening to all. Bye-bye.